Hi everybody, this is Kate Haley with Glazer's Camera here today. Happy Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday. Um, I never know what day of the week it is. How about you guys? Um, especially now that I feel like we're doing uh, so much work from home and all of that, I feel like the days kind of run on and on. Um, so thank you for joining us today. I'm excited for this one, partly because um, part of what we're gonna talk about today is something I've enjoyed exploring, especially over the past year. Um, but today we're here to talk about filters and gels. Um, and it doesn't maybe seem like a go-to conversation piece, but a lot of you are interested in the topic. So I'm excited that we're doing this one. Um, on the line today with us, we have Patrick from Lee Filters USA and Lillian also from Lee Filters USA. Patrick, could you tell us, I know you've got a slide in this about your presentation, but what is your role at Lee Filters? Cool. Uh, well, thanks for having us, Kate. It's always a pleasure working with uh, your guys' team. Um, but yeah, my role at Lee Filters is business development for the West Coast, so pretty much handling all of our dealers from the west of the Mississippi River. Um, it's not actually the full West Coast, but you know, it's kind of how we divide things up. So I just work with them on projects such as this, making sure that their business needs are met, handling customer questions, and just being kind of a liaison for the Lee brand to anyone who needs it um, in this area. Awesome. And Lillian, um, we have you on the line as well, and you help out with the marketing for Lee Filters USA. Is that correct? <laughs> that is correct. Um, okay. I do everything from social media to um, general marketing, events, trade shows, PR, you name it. It's, you know, I also work coincide with the UK team as well. So yeah, okay. all things marketing. Okay, awesome. Well, um, like I said, we're uh, super excited for this event today. We do have people tuning in from Paris, Canada, Washington, of course, London, Finland. Um, that's pretty cool. So thank you all for joining us today. A little bit on how this is going to work. We actually have two presentations. Patrick's going to talk a little bit about filters and get a little bit technical on those filters um, and some of the different options that are available from Lee Filters. And I am going to share some tips on long exposure photography using Lee filters and how to use gels. Super high level. The idea is to introduce you to some of these topics um, and also take your questions about filters and gels. So there will be opportunity for you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, and of course, we always do a little bit of Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, get those posted in the comments on Facebook or in the chat on YouTube. And like I said, we'll do a little bit of Q&A throughout. And before we get started, I also want to introduce Devin, who works with us here at Glazer. Say hi, Devin. Hi, Devin. <laughs> if you can call um, it work. <laughs> Devin is going to help out during the part of the presentation where I'm going to be presenting, and he'll be asking me your questions. So um, a voice that you won't get to see, unfortunately. But next time, we'll get his behind-the-scenes camera show up, uh, set up so you can see him, too. Um, so with all that said, um, let's get started. Patrick, let's kick it off with your presentation. Cool. Well, hopefully this isn't a death by PowerPoint, which a lot of people like to say, but I think there's a lot of really valuable information in here. And to kind of uh, go off of what Kate said, it's it's a really broad overview. There's definitely technical information and, you know, feel free to ask questions during it. And while it's top of mind, uh, you know, we definitely want to be a resource for you. So um, to get started, uh, we already kind of went over myself um, when it comes to what I do here at Lee. But I do have a bachelor's degree in radio, television, and film from Cal State Fullerton. I worked at Red Digital Cinema and shot over camera systems, so my background is definitely more in the cinema world. But I also a, enjoy photography as a hobby. It's something that I actually did a lot more last year, given the circumstances of being at home and being able to just kind of go outside and do stuff. So the photos you'll see, except for the one of myself with the camera, were all taken by me. Uh, I am a new dad. My daughter is about to be six months old this week. She's dressed as the child in the photograph being her crazy little self. Um, and just little other things, I do a lot of digital drawing. I like to make pizza. I used to play sports when you could get out there. So that's me in a nutshell. And now to what you came here for is the Lee systems. As you can see here, there's actually three different ones. The Lee 85, which is our newest, and it came out uh, almost a year ago. And it really caters to your more compact uh, cameras, some of the fixed lens stuff that Fuji makes. So it's a really versatile tool if you're out there running and gunning or even once you know, you're able to travel again, this is probably the, the system you would go with. 
You have the Lee 100, which is really our flagship filter holder, which is primarily what we're going to be discussing and seeing images that were produced with. It covers the widest variety of lenses that we have that are manufactured, and we have a nice variety of filters for it. And then the largest one is that SW150. The SW150 really caters towards your uh, super ultra wide lenses. So when you got want to get those sweeping landscapes, um, you know, on your Nikon 12 to 24, 14 to 24 lenses, this is pretty much what you're going to be going to. Um, so here with the Lee 100, kind of a simple overview, like we just said, um, all of our filters and uh, systems really attach easily to your lenses. Uh, we have these things called adapter rings, which I'll show you a little thing here in a little bit about uh, where it screws on on the front, similar to what you would use with a screw in filter. Once it locks in place, you then would attach the filter holder with a little clip, which allows you to give full 360 rotation of that filter holder uh, when you are using your various filters. So you can see in the photograph here, there's actually two filters in there, which allows you to kind of stack and rotate and uh, give you a little bit more of an image like you see it next to it where, you know, the filter is actually probably tilted at an angle to cut down that sun as well as get that nice smooth uh, effect you get with using long exposure photography. SW150 really focus on that old ultra light lenses, like I mentioned. Uh, the beautiful thing about this and our 100 line and even 8.5 is the fact that we pretty much make the same filters across the board with the 85 being a newer one. There isn't as many options quite yet, but we are in the process of you know expanding that line as time goes on. And here is a quick snapshot similar to the other two um, with the 85. Uh, something interesting for those who are kind of looking to get started with the filter system, maybe want to go on this smaller uh, range. We do actually have uh, 85 kits. That's how primarily they're sold. They'll come with various adapter rings to help get you started, the filter holder and a couple of different filters, depending on which kit you want. So it's definitely something to look at and consider as that starting point and gateway into the Elite ecosystem. If you're a little bit unsure of where to go. But the other thing is, too, is you can rely on the team at Glazers if you're speaking with them, either on the phone, in person, whatever they'll be able to kind of point you in that right direction because they're an extremely knowledgeable team. So we briefly touched about the adapter rings. Um, these are what actually screw onto the front of your lens via the threading. So you'll hear people talk about, you know, your diameter of being 52 millimeters, 47, 95, varying, you know, diameters that the front threading is. And we have a tool called System Match, which is on lead.com, which allows you to punch in whatever lens you have, the focal length, aperture, and then it will spit out what lens you would, what adapter ring you would need, as well as what system it's compatible for. So as you can see, kind of from the example in the image, you do have, you know, it's the Canon 24 to 70, fairly common. It can be used on the Lee 100 system and the 150, just not the 85. So this kind of allows you to kind of gauge if you have a, a, a bunch of lenses, what system may be best. Maybe you have four lenses that work with the 100 and only one that works with the 150 and you don't really want to have to spend the extra money to have both kits, you know which one's going to cover the most. Or if you have a lens you primarily see using filtration, then you can go that route. So it's a really valuable tool to have on the go. You can use it on your phone, on your computer, iPads, tablets, whatever you want. One of the big questions that we do get um, is with the standard adapter ring versus wide angle adapter ring. In the photograph, you can kind of see the logic as to why they're different. Essentially, what the wide angle adapter ring is doing is setting the, the distance um, of it a little bit farther apart. So then that way you're not going to get any, any vignetting issues that you may achieve with a standard adapter ring. So it can get a little bit confusing uh, for some people when they are looking at this information because they're like, well, my, my lens is an 82 millimeter, but there's two different rings. How would I determine it? If it doesn't show in system match, kind of like a general rule of thumb, of anything that's between 24 millimeters and 28 millimeters as your starting uh, focal point, you're probably gonna need the wide angle one just to make sure you're not gonna experience in that vignetting. Um, so on to the next one. One of the big products that Lee sells and is very common in landscape photography is neutral density graduated filters. So a lot of questions we get are, why do you use grads? Can I add these effects in post? What strength do I need? and what is the optimal placement for the grad. So there's a lot of different options here. Uh, just some history of actually graduated filters is they've actually been around for about hundred years and have always been used to reduce the brightness of selected areas of the frame to achieve a better exposure. A benefit of using a neutral density graduated filter is it allows you to 
closely mimic what you see in real life. Obviously lenses and cameras are not as, and sensors and cameras are not as strong as our eyeballs. So they perceive depth differently than we do. So in using a graduated filter, you're going to be able to see that separation that your, that your you know, brain naturally produces when you're actually looking at something versus looking at it in your phone on your photo app or even through your camera's lens. Even though NDs are gradually decreasing the contrast between extreme light and dark regions of your frame, the contrast within each region actually increases, which is improves that appearance of color and detail. So a brief example you can see here in the bottom portion of the, of the slide, you'll see what no filter looks like. It's pretty tiny, so I, I apologize if you can't really see it. But if you look up, you can kind of see the areas where the neutral density grad is sitting to actually bump up those levels. So you can see the image a little bit clearer some spots that um, I can really notice. I don't know if you can see my little pointer, but in this little region um, between the clouds and the edge of the frame, you can actually see the clouds in the distance when in the other photo, it's actually blown out due to the sunlight creeping through. Um, generally speaking, physical indie grads will always yield a higher quality of results than if you added in post, mainly because you are affecting the image right away versus in only the specific area versus manipulating the whole frame or having to spend hours upon hours of getting the colors right. So this will give you a better representation of what you see in person versus what your camera is going to perceive. Uh, physical grads actually work by darkening the brighter regions of the frame, whereas digitally applied NDs works by brightening the darker regions. So you can already see the difference of how digitization versus the actual physical filter will, will create these differences. When you brighten the darker regions of the frame, you actually run the risk of having a really noisy image or your low lights, um, you know, come disappearing or your highlights being blown out. So a ridge, you may actually end up creating an overexposure effect that you weren't looking for if you were using a filter in person uh, would be more ideal than doing that in post for that very reason. The big question is what strength do I need? Um, the best way of doing that is to determine which grad filter, you know, is going to create the darkest area. So Whenever I look at you know, an image and to get a good baseline, if it's extremely bright, you're gonna be looking closer to that 0.9 or three stops of neutral density because it's really gonna take it down. Um, our filters come in 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, and 1.2. Uh, we do have some strengths in between like 0.45 and 0.75, but they're not as common. It's a little bit more niche, but essentially you're really gonna look at the brightest portion of your image and then you're gonna determine based off that. A lot of ways that people will go about it is actually taking a still shot prior to applying filtration. So you can actually see where your histogram is creating. So you can get an idea of where your low lights and highlights are sitting, uh, how putting a filter actually affects how the camera is perceiving that light. Finding the optimal placement. This kind of ties into what I just mentioned when it comes to where the light is coming from. Obviously in the photo that you're seeing here, one of the biggest things is the lights off to the, the sun's actually peeking through on the left-hand side of the photograph. So you're gonna want that neutral density grad slightly tilted to the left. The benefit with the Lee system is you can actually rotate it. So then that way you can get the graduated filter line to go across a certain point of the image rather than being stuck just perfectly straight on up and down where you may get hot spots in one area or you may have a dark area to one side and you don't wanna stop that down. This allows you that flexibility and creativity to actually really get the ideal image. Um, one big thing to consider as well is the horizon line. Um, so you're shooting flat water landscapes or you're shooting mountains or you're shooting, you know, even in a cityscape. If you're having stuff that has a lot of foreground, midground, and background elements, a softer grad is always gonna be ideal. It versus, you know, something in the, like this photo uses a medium grad because there's some in the foreground a lot in the background, a little few things in the middle. And so that's going to give you that in between and a hard or very hard grad is going to be utilized mainly when you're shooting water or something that has a flat horizon where you can, it's clearly defined. For those who might be asking yourself right now, uh, what, what's the difference between soft, medium, very hard? It actually has to do with the graduation point within the filter itself. And I'll explain that a little bit um, on another slide. One of the biggest things that ties into that is considering what to use as well as what camera you're using it on. On this image, you can actually kind of see um, how the graduation point affects your image and where it becomes in a full frame sensor or a crop sensor, as well as an equivalence chart between the Lee uh, 100 system and the Lee 85 system, which actually can be found on our website as well. 
it'll kind of give you the determination that if on a hundred system, you're using a very hard grad. If you're using a 85 on a mirrorless camera, you're going to be getting a hard grad effect based off the way that it's actually perceiving the, the, the image itself. So the area of the transition of the Lee 100 ND grad will always appear bigger and extending over more of the scene on a crop sensor than when compared to using it on a full frame sensor. In essence, if you're using a crop frame sensor, you'll have fewer options. Either you can opt to move one level up towards a harder grad, or you can move a level down, but you, you have a little bit less to play with just because of the way that crop sensors actually function. As you can see here, this is where we get into soft, medium, hard, and very hard, as well as some images that we're utilizing the various um, grads that you can see above and below it. You can now actually visually see how the transition occurs and why you would use them in various scenarios such as soft water, clear defined horizons, very busy objects, or cityscapes. Um, personally, when I've used these, I typically am sitting between the hard and the soft, uh, just going back and forth because in where I live and the places I've gone and actually shot, it's kind of a blended area and I like to kind of see the varying effects that they utilize depending on the scenario. Um, and a lot of the time when you are using those hard and very hard, it can be a noticeable difference in your image depending on where it sits in front of the frame because with our grads, they're, um, they're 100 millimeters by 150. So it actually allows you to slide them up and down in the frame to get an optimal look. Here's another example of uh, images with no filtration and then with filtration and the varying graduated strengths in there. So you can kind of have a little bit more of a visual representation of how that actually functions. So uh, before we jump into long exposure, which I know Kate's going to go over a little bit more detail, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a broader overview. Were there any questions that came in uh, when it comes to neutral density graduated filters? Um, we've had a lot of questions coming in, but I've been answering them <laughs> during the chat. Let me see if we have something new. No um, you know, I, like one person was asking if it would make sense to use a medium graduated filter, but I think that goes to what are you photographing and what are your goals? So, Correct. and I think those slides that you just had are super helpful for that. Um, yeah, I think we're good right now because like I said, uh, I've been just answering a lot of them as we go. Um, yeah. Cool. Well then yeah. uh, off to onto our journey to long exposure. Um, so this is a very, very popular version of photography, especially with utilizing leaf filters. We actually have a number of different products that kind of are used to achieve this. Um, most of the time what anyone will associate with long exposure photography is going to be smooth ethereal images, flat water, milky clouds, hustle and bustle of people moving. Essentially what you're trying to do is create a ghosting effect by creating the shutter to be open for a longer period of time. So then that way you're actually getting more data into the camera sensor, but it's not those split seconds where it's actually just capturing that quick little still. Um, most of the time when you're actually going to be doing this, you're going to be doing um, six stops in neutral density, 10 stops or 15, depending on the uh, extended effect. And uh, you'll, you'll, there are a couple tools that we do have that Kate's gonna show you that will actually show you a calculator of how each will affect the other, depending on what stop length you choose and how long that actual image is gonna be a capture for or a comparison length of time that your, um, your aperture is gonna be fully open actually taking in that image. So, which long exposure filter do I need? Really depends on the type of effect that you're going with. Um, most of the time, you, you really wanna kind of look at the environment that you're in. Is it bright? Is it really dark? Um, with most, you know, glaciers obviously is in Seattle. We all know you guys get a lot of clouds up there. It's not as sunny. So sometimes, you know, the super stopper may not be the most ideal because you're pretty much gonna be blacking everything out. And it's gonna be a very, very long exposure where you might wanna bring a book or uh, another thing to read while you're capturing your image. Um, but they also kind of come into the effects you're looking for. The six stop, um, otherwise known as our little stopper, is ideal for those low light scenes either at the beginning or the end of the day. It's the perfect filter to choose when you want to retain some texture moving objects such as clouds or water. So as you can see on the image with the, the ship, you can actually still see some of that high definition, you know, in the woodwork as well as the sand in front of it. But the smoothed out portions are obviously what's been moving, the clouds, the water, and the sail. The 10 stop filter, otherwise known as our big stopper, is probably the most popular, most versatile option. It's probably the most common one you will see used in the field. 
being that it's usually not only in low light conditions, but it's also different times of the day when the light tends to be a bit harsher. As you can see in the, the image in the middle, you're getting, you're still retaining the color um, in the, the horizon and then everything in the water is starting to flatten out. It also looks like that was shot on a relatively cloudy day, which is giving you that ghosting effect above the water itself, almost like a mist. Um, but it is the most common. The next is going to be the 15 stop, which is known as the super stopper. Uh, it's usually designed for extremely bright conditions during the middle of the day. Um, it's typically considered unusable during uh, high contrast times, whether it's, you know, like if you're in a forest, it's night or morning. Uh, the softness arises from any movement the camera, you know, sees within the bright light. So you'll actually see it here in the 15 stop photograph, which is, I think, is brilliant being in, you know, black and white. You can really see how it's affecting the water specifically, as well as the clouds, where it's very, very ghostly but you're actually retaining all the detail in the trees and the mountain, um, seeing that obviously you're, you're getting a lot of hot spots kind of in that horizon. So that's, that's kind of the overview. One thing to uh, remember, at least when it does come to our stoppers, on a technical level, there is going to be a slight blue cast uh, to it. So some people really enjoy it. Um, it also makes it easier if you are trying to color correct and post for whatever reason, you know that there's gonna be a little bit more blue, so you can actually extract that if you need to to help fine tune your image. And we actually, um, we do make a separate line called IRND, which is gonna be these exact same filters, but they're just gonna be, they're truly neutral, but I'll show you those in a little bit. So a lot of the questions is, you know, how, how do I start with landscape photography, you know, long exposure landscape photography? What do I need to do with my camera? Do I just put the filter on and click the button? And does it go? What happens? If you were to put any of these filters on the front of your lens and just do a normal exposure, your image is going to just be blacked out. It'll be extremely dark, especially if you're using those 10 or 15 stops. The six stop, you might get a little bit, but it's just going to treat it as like you're ad adding actual neutral density in front of it the same way you would do in motion world or if you're really just wanting to stop down a whole image like in a portrait. Um, that's the effect it'll look. So there actually are steps in place for you to be able to actually produce the long exposure images. One thing I like to say is this is obviously a creative process. There are some numbers that we can put behind it that kind of give you an idea of length of time, but ultimately it's up to you. When I've dug, gone and done this, when I first started here with Lee, I followed these guides, but I ended up just kind of picking my own length of time and doing various test shots just to see what I like better. It's a, it's a personal preference for some of these and you know, there's no real rhyme or reason to personal preference or creative choices. When it comes to getting started, um, the first thing you want to do is obviously set up your camera on a tripod without any filters in place. The tripod's going to allow you to keep your camera steady because if you were to do this hand holding for whatever reason, everything's going to get blurred out because no one can sit perfectly still for a long period of time. If you can, I commend you. Uh, next thing, you're going to want to swap from autofocus to manual focus. Part of the reasoning being is if you actually are putting the filter on and you're on autofocus, your camera is going to start to have that blooming effect because it's going to try to find a focus point, even though it's so dark, which is going to just totally make your image unusable. And manual allows you to pick your focus point and your lens is not going to try to compensate for what you're doing. The next thing you want to do is calculate your exposure as normal without the filter in place. And then you would fix your aperture for the shot. Then adjust the shutter speed to allow for the density of the filter you're using. All stoppers have a handy little chart similar to what you can see here um, on the PowerPoint to my left um, in the packaging. The table shows you how much you need to increase your original shutter speed by um, when you're using either the big, a little, or a super stopper. Uh, there's, already, there's also an app which Kate will show you. Uh, once the images are composed, manually focus the lens and place the filter into the holder. One thing to really note is all stoppers or um, IRND filters, anything you're using for long exposure needs to be on the back of the filter holder. All the filter holders come standard with uh, two slots. You can obviously add three, but it needs to be all the way up against the back to create a light seal. So you're not going to get any coming in, which would then, you know, have an effect on the image, which you actually see a little bit later. Uh, step five, cover your eyepiece or turn it or flip down the switch. If you're using mirrorless, you don't have to worry about this as much because then you're not risking light coming in through the back. You're also going to want to probably cover your um, the, the filter holder on the outside if you want, maybe with a hat or a hood or if there's sun coming in from a different angle, block that out just to help prevent any light leak because it can happen even with the foam gaskets on the back of the filter itself. Fire the shutter and leave it open um, for the required time you selected. 
And then after that, you'll be able to see your image. So it's, um, there's a lot of different options what you could do, but my advice is get out there, do a couple test shots, get a feel for what you really like. And then you'll be able to know after a few different times of, you know, if a look you're going for the length of time that works ideally for you in those situations you're in. You can now see a few images that were shot with the big super and little stopper and their varying effects like we mentioned before. So this is the other line that I was referencing, our Pro Glass IR&D. Um, it is high quality glass. It's also truly neutral density with no color cast at all. So if you are looking for something that is gonna be dead neutral, this is for you. Uh, it also will block uh, UV and IR protection, uh, accurate exposure. Um, this is actually a repurposing of glass that we worked with um, Panavision on which was for cinema version. So it's gonna be more of that mold, which in cinema, you can't have any casts within it because then it becomes a, a problem for post and everything else. So this is really in, designed in conjunction with that thought process. You can also see here, uh, the, all these images, by the way, uh, do not have any color correction or anything done in post. These are all straight from camera. You can see how rich the color is in this by keeping those truly neutral density um, filters in place with no color cast. So the last little thing that uh, we're going to talk about here is polarizers. You've heard the name, you've heard the term before, you have them on your sunglasses um, and you use them in photography a lot. You know, why are you going to use a polarizer? Um, they're great for reducing glare, impro improving saturation, and are always a good idea when capturing water, foliage, sky, or any highly reflective surface. You can then use it to eliminate that reflection which can create hot spots or other undesirable effects in your imagery. Uh, polarizers will make sky appear, uh, you know, a deeper blue and take away those reflections and often in, in times improving the transparent, transparency of the highlights um, beneath the surface, like an example above, they will reduce the contrast between the land and the sky. So you can actually see with the polarizer, you're pulling more detail and more color out of the image than when you originally shot without it. Uh, personally, I use a polarizer a lot, regardless of what I'm doing, unless it's completely dark and there's no reflection, uh, because I like the way it does actually saturate the image. There are some key differences between a linear and circular polarizer. Uh, linear polarizers are a little bit of, uh, you know, older. They're going to be our square filters. That's in the SW150 system. They're also going to be cheaper, but they only work in a specific way, unlike the circular one, which is probably what most of you are more com uh, used to using. Um, if you have screw-in polarizers, those are going to be circular and not linear where you can actually rotate it. Um, the other good thing with linear is it actually affects your metering systems and autofocus and SLRs. So they're mainly used on film cameras or they're mainly used in, in the cinema space where you're not really moving it too much and, and you don't have some, an autofocus or anything else coming through. Another thing to keep in mind when you are using a polarizer is you are going to have a one and two thirds stop loss every single time. So prepare for that based off of your settings as well as the environment you're in, just knowing that if you do put that polarizer on and all of a sudden you're asking yourself, why is my image darker than I originally thought? It is because it will reduce light. Another good polarizing tip here, um, it's kind of a good rule of thumb. It's also funny because you are gonna be using your thumb. It's on a clear sunny day, a polarizer has its strongest effect when the camera's positioned 90 degrees. So pretty much what you're gonna to wanna to do is use your thumb to make the L because it's the closest thing we all have to a 90 degree angle, point your index finger towards the sun and then move it accordingly to where the lights can be polarizing because essentially you're gonna create that reflection, which is why if you do use a circular polarizer and you do rotate it, you will see every rotation creates a change in the scene itself. It either makes it saturated, you'll see it's kind of split the image in half because that's how the light is actually being manipulated at that point. So that's pretty much uh, us in a nutshell. I know it's pretty quick, uh, but obviously I do want to let uh, Kate have her time shine and kind of go over more of that creative process, which I'm sure you're all more a lot interested in than uh, the technical side. But these are our social media platforms uh, pretty much everywhere. We always do like seeing what people are up to. So if you are shooting with leaf filters, you know, please feel free to tag us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever you're at. Um, and share your content. You never know, Lillian may be lurking in the background, just uh, hitting that share on the stories or even maybe contact you to, to do a little feature on, on our actual feed. So a lot of options there. And I think from here, I'm gonna kick it over to Kate and she can uh, talk to you guys a little bit more about that creative process. Awesome, that was really great. 
Um, we did have a ton of questions come in, and I think uh, between myself and Devin, we got all of them answered. Um, I did want to ask one thing. Um, I know that, uh, so this is the filter holder that comes with a 100 setup. Um, I haven't tried taking the two holder piece off to put the three holder piece on. Is mm -hmm. that relatively easy? Uh, one of our viewers lost the little tool. And so Devin recommended like a small screwdriver, like flathead, like maybe the ones you get for your glasses repair um, to pop that off. Is that a yeah. good yeah, definitely. I mean, even if you use the larger flathead, that's pretty much what it is. Um, okay. I've used my my nails before, like my thumb, and just kind of pop it. It is pretty oh, yeah. easy to get there. If you're, okay. you know, you won't break your nails or anything like that, because I was afraid I was going to bend mine back. But uh, you can use I that totally or any, any flat surface that can kind of fit into that little slot. You can pop it off and then and okay. secure it. So even it. like so a nail file locked. or something like that for yeah. the ladies out there. So, um, And if, if that tool is lost, don't worry about it. There are ways to get it still off. You're not, you know, completely out of luck on that one. Okay. Let me, uh, so Donna's asking, um, how much light does a polarizer typically lose? It's normally around two stops of light, right? Yeah. So the rule of thumb is kind of like two stops, but the actual, our, our polarizer is one and two thirds stops of light. Okay. So, so if you want to build quite. in two just to be safe, just assume two, but know that you have a little play. Okay. And then could you share the dimensions of the Lee 85 holder? I know that it's intentionally smaller than the 100, um, but I haven't seen that one in person yet. So is it significantly smaller or? Yeah, so they pretty much the 85 would fit within the 100 holder if you put them like kind of like this. Um, I don't have one physically. So it would fit inside? Home, unfortunately, otherwise I'd show you, but um, I don't have the, the exact dimensions, but it, it essentially, if you were to take an 85 millimeter ring or, you know, like, uh, put it there, it's going to be a little bit larger than that to obviously encompass the width. So then that way you're not getting any of that vignetting if it was, you know, a lens that was bigger. So just think of it from like that perspective. Right. Um, someone's asking, is that graphic that you shared with the thumb finger technique, is that available for people to um, view somewhere online? Um, I don't recall where this one came from, but I'll leave it up here if you guys want to screenshot it really quick. Um, okay. Uh, that's probably the best course because I don't believe this, it might be on our website, but I don't remember where this originally was pulled from for the presentation. Okay, so uh, Andrej, I'm not sure how to pronounce your first name there. Uh, just take a quick, uh, sorry, Jean <laughs> was asking about that. Take a quick screenshot um, and, and this will be up on the Glazers YouTube channel for a little bit. So you can also scroll through that and watch this again. Um, so is IR a big concern for someone starting out? There's a big com cost and cost difference. So um, for someone who's just getting started, should they maybe start with like the 85 or the 100 kit? And then if they really decide, oh, this is what I want to do all the time, uh, make that deeper investment in the IR system. Yeah, so the IR and D is actually not going to be really getting that true IR image that you, you might be referring to because most of the time when you are getting anything that's IR where you're going to have kind of like that red and white hue to it, your camera actually has to be modified to do that because most cameras come with um, like an IR right. filtration already applied to it. So you actually need to take that out to be able to capture that kind of image. The IR and D is mainly just, um, since it does re remove it in, it in the UV, it's just, a, you know, Way that we named it it doesn't really create the ir effect but okay if you are just starting the stoppers are more common there's something you're gonna that are cheaper so that's probably the starting point um and right now the ir and d's are only in the sw 150 and 100 system so if you are looking at that already and that's kind of where you want to steer then that will also dictate which filter system you go with makes sense okay well that was awesome and informational um we're gonna, uh, so thank you for all of that. Um, we're gonna shift um, a little bit and talk about some of the creative side of using these filters in the field. Um, over the past year, I have been doing a ton of long exposure photography. And so um, Patrick has already shared some of the tips I'm gonna talk about, but I wanna talk about like why you might start exploring this if you haven't yet. Um, and share some photos and talk a little bit more about the process that I've done in the field that's helped me really kind of move from just creating like a snapshot of a place that's pretty to creating something with a little bit more story and intention behind it. So I'm gonna screen share now and um, I won't be as active in the chat um, because I'm gonna be focusing on the presentation, but Devin is going to help out with that. Um, 
So here we go. I'm going to go to the first slide. Um, so um, there we go. Okay. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> um, and, and Patrick and Lillian are still with us. So keep those questions coming in if you have them. Um, and what we'll probably do is just a little bit of Q&A throughout and then a, a roundup of Q&A towards the end. Um, and I might talk through these a little bit more quickly because we have just over 20 minutes left. So just a little about me. Um, when I'm not doing the event programming for Glazers, I'm also a portrait and travel photographer. And obviously in 2020, travel was really kind of out. Um, so since I couldn't travel and I also was not taking portrait clients because of COVID, I dove into a creative process that I've explored off and on over the years, but really, really got into um, last year. So um, let's talk about why. So I already kind of gave you a couple of reasons as to why I took some time to get in and explore these techniques. Um, but I wanted to think about like, how can I do more, something more interesting take just a standard photo and make it kind of shine and sing and be more artistic instead of just kind of being capturing this place. Um, so through this technique of long exposure photography, I go to a place and I kind of really take in the scene and observe and then decide on my composition. Um, and this whole process truly forces you to slow down. Um, a lot of times, if you think about traveling and going to a place like Iceland, you know, I've only been to Iceland once, but I only had three days there. And I remember like running around the country like a crazy person because there was so much to do and I had so little time. Um, so I, you know, wasn't really set up for success in getting some of these longer exposures. Now I got some cool long exposures, but they were like a minute here and a minute there. Um, long story short, slowing down can just be super beneficial to really let you create something that kind of stands out a little bit. Um, it also became kind of a meditative process. Like I go to the beach, I go to different parts of the city where I can find unique architecture or sculpture and just kind of enjoy being there, enjoy being in the moment and creating. Um, and like I said, the images that you'll create tend to have a more artistic look to them more thought, more time, more process, okay? So we'll talk high level about the gear. Um, obviously, you need a camera and a lens. Um, you know, I say that, but I put bulb in there because you need a camera that will let you do several minutes of an exposure. So your camera really needs to have bulb mode. Um, I do shoot with a Fujifilm system, and most of those cameras that are at least made in the past few years have the option to go up to 15 minute exposure without using a cable release, which is amazing. So um, I use the self timer a lot, um, but if you don't have that system, get a cable release, that's gonna save you time and uh, blurriness in your shots. I love a wide angle lens for this kind of technique because I like to have maybe elements in the foreground and then cool clouds or interesting water in the background. Obviously we need a tripod. Um, and then for this, I did use the Lee Long Exposure Kit, which includes, uh, Devin, I'm gonna hold some stuff up to the camera. Uh, this is the 10 stopper, so you can't see through that. Fully, fully dark. Um, these are the little gaskets that um, Patrick was talking about. In a lot of instances, I would stack this with a six to get me like a lot of stops away from bright, bright light. Um, this is the hard grad. You know, and a lot of times, and I'll show you some examples, I paired this with a 10 stop to get my sky to be a little bit darker. So we'll talk through that in just a moment. And then this is a filter holder. You might've seen me uh, hold it up. This is the 100 filter holder, and this is the little ring adapter. So always when you're buying filters, my recommendation is to get a filter holder or filters that fit your largest lens, so the largest filter size, and then you get the little stepping rings so that you can adapt them to other lenses. So I have like 10 of these <laughs> in different sizes, but it means I buy one filter kit system and then I adapt to fit on the other lenses. So that is totally a good thing to do. All right, so back to the presentation. Using a cable release, again, once you're on your tripod, cable release means you hit that cable release to initiate the shutter and you're not touching the camera. So any touch to that camera once the, the exposure is started 
you could potentially introduce some movement. Um, Patrick talked about a dark cloth or a hat or a scarf that maybe you wrap around the lens or your viewfinder to prevent light from coming in. Um, I haven't had any issues with this. I have had it happen between filters if the direction of the sun is just right. So it is something to keep in mind. Um, and it, the chair or the stool idea is if you're going to be in a place and you're doing eight minute exposures, uh, Patrick talked about bringing a book. Uh, I have books on my phone or things like that, you know, but also like you can keep yourself entertained that way, but you can also just like take in the space that you're in. But having something to sit on for an eight minute exposure is kind of a nice thing to do too. Um, I, this is just a photo of what's in the long exposure kit. There's a lot of different options. You don't have to get a kit. You can start with a holder and one filter. Um, I would say that if you're interested in exploring long exposure during the day, get at least a 10 stop filter to start. So the big stopper will be your friend. Um, here's a peek at the app. So this is available for Android or iOS and you can download this and you just basically select which filter you're using and input the shutter speed that your base shot is without a filter on. And then the app will help give you a starting point to get you that first slower shutter speed. Now here you'll make some adjustments potentially and you might start at say four seconds if you're on the big stopper, but then you might go to eight seconds. You might play around a little bit and see what you get creatively. But this app is a great way to give you guidance and get you started on those exposures. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about process. Um, so the first thing I love to do is like I have like lists of places in mind of where I want to go. When I get there, I kind of scout out my location. I figure out where do I want to shoot from. Um, and then once I get set up, camera on tripod, have my composition in place, I'll start with my base exposure. And what this does is it gives me, first of all, examples for stuff like this where I can show you here's what it looked like. It's not a terrible photo. Um, the shadows to the highlights are very extreme because the sun's setting and they're right behind and it's right behind the trees and so the trees are heavily silhouetted and the sky is a little bit starting to get overexposed. So in the setup I want to keep my ISO low. The goal is like clean images, right? Lots of detail, low grain, all that good stuff. So 100 to 200 depending on your camera look up your native ISO and start at that where your ISO is cleanest. Um, set your aperture. Here you want to close down. You want to take light away with your aperture because you want to let by light back in with your shutter speed, okay? Um, so a lot of times I'll be at f11, f16, f22, depending on the lens. Some lenses might go to 32. So I take light away there, take light away with my ISO, and then I'm going to add that light back in with my shutter speed. So this is my first shot here at f16, ISO 200, 20th of a second, okay? If I add the 10 stopper, I now get to go to two minutes. But you'll notice because it's sun setting and the sun is like right smack dab in the middle of the shot, um, that part is very, very overexposed still. The clouds are getting interesting, but if I add the graduated filter on top of the 10 stop, Look at what I can achieve, okay? So we went from kind of meh to something more interesting. And obviously this is edited as well to highlight and bring in some of the warmer tones of a sunset um, because also part of the process is creativity, right? So then um, as the sun continued to set, I went for a four minute exposure and I actually brought a little bit more light back in with my aperture because the sun had set already. So just to show you the progression again. So 20 second, 1 20th of a second, two minutes, two minutes adding that neutral density grad, and then four minutes after the sun had set. So I'm gonna just go through a few more examples, share some tips, and then we're gonna take a few minutes to talk about something completely different, but related, okay? <laughs> um, so here I'm at uh, the uh, water <laughs> park, I mean, the. Here. Sorry guys, I only have one coffee today, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm at the pier in West Seattle at the water taxi. Uh, here we are at 35 hundredth of a second. Um, I did realize when I took that first photo that I hadn't closed my aperture down enough. So here I'm at F32 at 15 seconds with a 10 stopper, okay? And intentionally getting movement of the water taxi as I believe it was about to pull out. 
So I call this one Ghost Ship, or Ghost Ship version one. There's a couple of versions of it. Um, view of the skyline, again, here we're at 1 1 40th of a second, and now at two minutes, okay? Um, you can also get up super early and do this. So even at dawn or dusk, you might start to be able to slow down that shutter speed. So here's 6.5 seconds without any filter. But then when I add the 10 stop filter in this case, I'm now up to two minutes. And then I pushed it a little bit to four um, just to see what I could achieve. I really kind of wanted to show the clouds here, right? And that's what I'm thinking about. When I'm thinking about this, I either want movement in the clouds, smooth water, one or the other, or maybe even both like this example. And then we have the Seattle waterfront. Um, you know, if you live in the Seattle area, the Great Wheel is a very popular place to go and take photos. My goals are to try and do something a little bit different whenever I do that, because I've photographed the Great Wheel a lot since it's been here in Seattle. Um, but here we are at 2 50th of a second at F8, and then four minutes with the 10 stop and the six stop. So that's the big stopper and little stopper stacked. And just look at what it does, right? It's just smoothing things out. It's giving you a more intentional, creative approach. Um, thinking about something like architecture, this is the Museum of Pop Culture here in Seattle. So 1 25th of a second versus 40 seconds. So look at how cool those clouds look in the sky, right? Before, after. And then one final shot to just kind of highlight one of my favorite shots I made last year, or maybe earlier this year, it's all kind of a blur, um, was of the Space Needle and the Museum of Pop Culture um, with a super wide angle lens from Fuji, the 10 to 24, 25 seconds. This was one of those days where I went out to shoot and thought, maybe I'll get something because there was a lot of cloud cover, but it was moving fast. And so we went from blue skies to super overcast within minutes. Um, so I feel like this shot is a little bit lucky, but so much fun to just kind of go out and do something a little bit different. Devin, do we have any questions on any of that so far? Uh, we have a few, actually. Okay. Um, one of them I answered, and that was um, what the name of the app was, and it's oh, it Lee Filters, Lee Filters. Yeah. Uh, Stopper Exposure, because oh. they have more than one app. Oh, okay. Yep. Nice um, to know. Another one was, uh, do you use Fujifilm's uh, DR, the dynamic range? You know, I don't mess with that feature. Devin would be able to speak a little bit more as to why I probably should be using that. <laughs> I mean, yes and no. Um, yeah. there's, there's definite like benefits to the dynamic range. Um, I think everybody's one. just at 100 all the time. Yeah. I, yeah. I kind of have it at auto because it's dependent on the ISO. Right. And it's also more so baked into a JPEG. So. And these are everything I've shown are going to be the raw files that have been edited through Lightroom. Yeah. Or Capture One. Um, I think somebody had to take a work call and <laughs> they were wondering if they were, if, if the filters work with infrared photography. I think um, Patrick may have answered that earlier. Patrick, do you have any insight on using these filters with like a camera that has been converted for IR? Yeah, you can definitely do that. Uh, we do have some that are designed for like color correction uh, use okay. cases. And we do have some filters that are supposed to be used with IR. It's not something we're really manufacturing anymore. There's a few available, but you can use regular filtration even when doing okay. IR photography. So it's totally worth an experiment to see what you get, it sounds like. Yeah, definitely. And that could look really cool, actually. I always love the look of IR files. So, okay. Anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. Um, wait. How do you, how, <laughs> what do you do to remember what combo of filters uh, you've done? I make a lot done? of notes. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. I use my phone or a notebook with me and I make notes on what, like what shot has which combinations. Mostly because I do, I want to be able to replicate things that I've done before. And a lot of the shots that I shared, I created with intention for these kinds of presentations. So it's very important for me to know what I did. So a lot of times it's just a note on my phone, to be honest. And then I also tend to carry like a notebook with me too. So lots of notes. <laughs> okay, yeah. let me get through these next slides. We just have a few more minutes left, but let's talk about um, things that can be problematic. <laughs> So clean your sensors, please. 
Before you do this, um, F-22, F-16, F-32 is very unforgiving. This shot is from a Fujifilm GFX-50R, um, and there was just that one little squiggle. That one's easy to fix, but please clean your sensors. <laughs> All those little dots are me uh, using the clone tool or in Lightroom um, after also taking it into Photoshop to get rid of some bigger issues. So, and I have cleaned my sensor, my friends, so clean your sensors regularly if you want to explore this type of photography. So please, 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 that's all I ask. Um, also, one thing you might find are hot pixels. So if you're really like getting into the nitty gritty of your files, when you're going in and editing, you might see little white dots and those are hot pixels, which can happen with some of the long, long, long exposures. So, um, and then Patrick talked about this a little bit. I talked about this a little bit. When you're stacking things or when you're even just putting the filter initially in the holder, you know, you want to make sure that these gaskets are fully covering the opening to help prevent light coming between the filter and your lens. Between the angle of light or something like that, you can get like these weird banding issues. Um, so this is also where like wrapping a cloth around the lens that kind of covers the filter but obviously doesn't get in front of the lens um, could be helpful. So like I normally have a scarf, so that is like something I could throw over um, the filters and the end of the lens. So just something to keep in mind. And oftentimes you don't see this in the field. Um, fortunately, when I did like this outing, I took a bunch of photos and still had usable images. But this one I liked a lot and I couldn't use it. So other things to keep in mind are how windy it is. So you might need to like weigh down your tripod with a camera bag or something like that just to make sure it's super stable. Um, cover your viewfinder, we talked about that. And if your camera has the option, or your lenses have the option, uh, turn off the image stabilization. Once you put it on a tripod, that stabilization can potentially create movement. So it's just better to turn it off because you're stabilizing your gear by having it on the tripod already. Okay, I have five minutes now to talk about gels. Any questions on long exposure before we go? Uh, we do have one from Fraser. Uh, okay. Evening from Scotland. Thanks Hi. for joining us. I love Scotland. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what white balance setting do you use when using your big stopper? Oh, that's a great question. Honestly, I probably am using auto. Um, like Patrick mentioned, there is a little bit of a blue cast on the files, um, and sometimes that really works with the like the mood and the tone. Um, but I'll do any any white balance and color correction in Lightroom or Capture One or Photoshop or some combination there and of. So yeah, I tend to use auto a lot. The only time I don't use white balance in auto is when I'm using studio lighting. So which is a great transition to what we're going to talk about next. Oh. We're going to talk about gels. Wow. So you're like, how are we going to go from long exposure to gels? And uh, when Patrick and I and Lillian were having this conversation about doing this. We wanted to highlight just a variety of products um, and creative techniques and tools that you can use. And this is something else that Lee carries. So I have one right here. Um, Lee has been making gels. Patrick, do you know how long Lee has been making gels? <laughs> Any Forever. idea? Forever. Forever. Beginning of time. <laughs> No, so that's, like, like, that's actually our main product lineup. So most of, most people actually associate Lee filters with the gels rather than right. the camera filters. Um, yeah. So this is this is more of the bread and butter of the company's legacy, uh, if we're being honest. Right. And so gels, I know we have just a few minutes left, but gels give you the opportunity to correct light and get creative with your lighting um, for still photography, filmmaking, and all of the things. So. Really, when we're thinking about using gels, we are thinking about getting something right in camera or creatively done in camera that you cannot do in post-production, okay? So this is just real quick to show this. This is the Master Location Lighting Pack. What's great about this is there's like, I don't even know how many uh, gels are in here. There's like 30 or something like that. Um, but it gets you a variety of colors, diffusion, and color correcting options for like 50 bucks. It's a great, great steal. Um, and I've been using Lee gels for longer than I care to admit. So <laughs> we're not gonna go into how long I've been using them. But what I wanted to do is just take a few minutes to show some examples of why you might want to use gels if you're doing lighting. And this applies to continuous light, um, flashes, 
all the things. So first, I'm gonna show you some photos of my friend Chris, who is a photographer here in the Seattle area. Um, and he was gracious enough to uh, sit in for some shots when I recently acquired this master location kit. So um, the first thing I wanna talk about super high level is color correction. Now, if you're ever doing a location shoot or taking photos in your home and your ambient light is warm and you're, maybe you're using speed lights and those are cool, that color means you're gonna have blue light on a warm background. So you could use something like a color temperature orange gel, put that over your speed light or your continuous light or whatever light you're using and match your light to the background light because guess what you can do when you get to editing? Well, there's two things you could do. You could actually change your white balance in camera or you can do a quick edit in Lightroom to fix your color and your cover color will be more even. So that's one thing we can do. There's also a color temperature blue gel so that you can use to compensate for other kinds of light. There's also uh, fluorescent gels that you can use to fix color on fluorescent lights or match color rather. Um, so that's one way that you can do this and the CTO gels tend to come in a quarter, half or full CTO. Um, you can also use these to create like golden hour. So put a, a full CTO on a light and watch everything get like this golden, golden color. I've also stacked those on top of a light to make things super, super warm. That's a really specific look that you're going for, but I've had people ask me to do that. So, um, Devin, is there a question about? Oh, I just wanted to say that there's a, another app for. Is there an app? For there's a Lee Swatchbook. Oh, nice. Yep. So check that app out because that will probably share the broad spectrum of Lee gel filters options out there in the world. They even have a different app for their Pro Glass IRND. Oh, okay. Separate so from the stoppers. The so many apps. So okay. many apps. So, okay, so that's one idea. Thinking about correcting light in camera so that when you get to processing, your processing is not trying to fix blue and warm. You're just fixing one thing. So that's one thing that makes your life easier as a photographer. Um, the other thing I wanna just show is a few creative uses. And this is where I tend to play more. Um, starting with just a, a warm light on my subject and then some fun color, purple, blue, red, teal, yellow, green, like whatever color you want, Lee has it. Um, not to make this sound salesy, but I'm just saying there's all the options. But what I also did here was we got this, the regular looking shot with the normal skin tones that are slightly warm. And then I added this filter that I've fallen in love with called Moroccan Frost, which actually, um, because of the density of it, tends to take a little bit of the light away. Um, but I liked that effect here. I like the tone here. It's a little bit different. And when we're thinking about like getting creative versus correcting things, um, there's no limits to what we can do. So this is a combination of um, Moroccan Frost on my subject and then mauve on the background. And these shots were just done with speed lights um, and different kinds of modifiers, a MagMod modifier and a Westcott modifier. Um, for a couple of shots, we went to a Westcott Solix using barn doors so that light has a different look to it. It's a little bit harder, a little edgier. And so for the shot on the left, we just went for a red gel because we were just playing around and having fun and seeing what we could get. Um, and because of the lighting setup, the background is not really lit up that much. Um, and then on the second image, I just added another LED that was a cool temperature to kind of play around with like balancing red and blue a little bit. When you're thinking about getting into color, I definitely recommend like doing a little research on color theory so you can understand primary colors and complementary colors and how they work together. Um, but also knowing that we can use color to affect mood um, and tell a story in our images. So just one or two more slides and then we're gonna wrap this up. Um, this is actually a fluorescent correcting gel um, but I was like, I like the way this looks just as a regular color, so I'm gonna use it. Um, and in here, we just played with the brightness and the angle of the light. So that's how the shift of left to right affected the background as well. Um, so really, this is just to get you thinking about if you're interested in lighting or you want to correct light, using gels is a great way to do that. 
uh, relatively inexpensive. And to me, it's great to have like kits like this so that I can get creative or correct things and get as much possible in camera on my images so that there's less time on a computer editing and more time creating images. So, Devin, any quick questions on that? I know we're a little bit over time. Uh, they're a little technical, actually, okay. about um, hot pixels. Um, June asked, uh, they recently came across hot pixels and had a fit. Understandable. Yeah. Um, just like you mentioned, uh, what are they from besides long exposures? Are they exclusive to long exposures? I and think it's got something to do with the sensor heating up. Yeah from being used for a real long period of time. I believe so. Do you, yeah, and you'll, Patrick, you'll do you have any insight on that? Yeah, you'll also notice them a lot more in the long exposure because you're having it be activated for a longer period of time. So yeah. with a normal quick shutter, you're not going to notice it because it's so fast. But with long exposure, you're opening it up for an opportunity to just kind of see those little blemishes that your sensor may have yeah. that you normally don't notice. Right, and, there, and, it might, and you might not see them at all, but it sounds like maybe, uh, I mean, I know I've seen them but like you said, I've noticed them in my long exposures, but I don't see them in my day-to-day -day shots. Yeah. So there's, is there a follow-up on one that? One more question. OK. <laughs> All um, right. The one, uh, Paul asks, the 100 circular rotates independent of the filter holder, and I'm interested in the 150 CP. But will I have to rotate the filter holder itself? In other words, does the 150 prevent use of a graduated neutral density? So you won't be able to use them the same way you would with the 100 because we don't actually have the same type of circular polarizer. Um, when I refer to circular, I'm actually meaning the shape of it because you do have linear polarizers and circular polarizers in the square format. So we do have a circular polarizer at square for the SW150, but that would require you to know in advance where that 90 degree angle is. So then you can use your grads in conjunction, but you won't be able to get the same rotation effect you do with the 100. Okay, and if, if you need to hear that answer again, which I know that I would, <laughs> um, like I said, this will be up on our YouTube channel for at least a little while, so you can totally re-watch that. Um, I have one more slide to share because um, there's something awesome going on right now on our website. There's sales to be had. Um, so there's a bunch of um, products that are available on the Glazers website that are discounted. Um, so if you just go to Glazers, and I did drop links in the chat early on, um, but if you go to our website and search for Lee and 100, you can see like this whole pages and pages of all these Lee products, um, or if there's something specific that you're um, interested in, um, just go to our website, glazerscamera.com, uh, type it into the search, um, and save on filters today. Um, and that promo is actually going through, I believe, the end of June. Is that yeah, correct? Yes, correct. I'm getting a nod. So yeah, um, yeah. So um, I so if we don't have any more questions, um, I just want to take a moment to um, thank you, Patrick, for being here with us today, and Lillian yes. for being with us today, um, and thank you all for tuning in. I hope this was helpful for everyone. Um, and if you have continued questions about gels or filters, you can totally ask those in the comments on the video or uh, give us a call here at the store. Um, all right. Well, you guys, uh, Patrick, Lillian, thank you so much. Everybody, you guys have a great rest of the day. If you're in the Seattle area, it's sunny. So I hope that somebody somewhere is out there um, sun in. Um, and thank you all from for everyone who's tuned in from around the world. That's really amazing. We appreciate it. We have more presentations happening this week and continuing education all the time. So tomorrow we've got bird photography, Friday, we've got a Canon video session. Saturday, I'm teaching long exposure, but I'm sorry it's full. So if you didn't get signed up yet, I'll just have to do it again. Um, and there's even more. So go to our website, glazerscamera.com, and go to the events page to see what else is coming up. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>